to our Lord who has given us the continuation of life both temporal and eternal to the honored and esteemed pastor of this great church who has provided excellent services to the church and to the world. He is one who represents us by his total preparation and his perfect dedication to the will of God. He has been very kind to keep me informed about our celebration that we were planning to have in just a few days. I thank him for his kindness to me, and I thank the family for their endorsement of this decision. We would like to say that this is not an easy time for me. For in times like these, we become mirrors of our own mortality. Nevertheless, so much was given to me from that detour in my preparation for ministry that brought me to Atlanta for the first time, for any length of time, that is, in 1961 when I became a Danforth Interseminary in turn to work on becoming a minister in this college. The Danforth people wanted preachers to go back to college. They could either be graduates of their seminaries or they could be graduates to be. And I fell into that category and Morehouse was selected for me, and it became perhaps the most meaningful experience of amazing academic grace that I found in this powerful city and that powerful school called Morehouse, whose president remained as long as he could, and also I got a chance to know the King family close up by, made by their instinctive kindness. I was received undeservedly, very warmly and encouragingly. They just kind of got to know old Charles and did me a lot of good. I want to say that I've changed the topic for one reason, at least, and that is what I'm going to say is more timely than what I would like to say. So I'm going to keep it short. In Job chapter 38, verse 1, we have the words, Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. We stand to declare the triumph of this pastor, Reverend 
Professor Dr. Joseph Lawrence Roberts, Jr. He who was faithful unto death now wears the crown of life. We are not here to focus on his death, but to thank God and praise God for his wonderful life on earth and for his continuing life beyond our sight and touch. We want to thank and praise God, and we are determined not to give to death any more than we must. We must give up the physical remains, the mortal existence, but we do not have to give to death. The immortal soul, the eternal self, the marvelous mind, the sanctified spirit, or the gallant character of Joseph Lawrence Roberts, Jr. We will never have to surrender his courageous essence, his wonderful memories, or his perpetual influence. We are not here to mourn the victory of death, because death has no victory over those who are made and saved in the image, in the image of God. <clears throat> We are up in here to celebrate the enduring quality of the life of this strong and fearless prophet and to be encouraged and inspired by this sure and certain victory through Christ. We do not ask of this, my beloved Ebenezer family or Atlanta family, we do not ask you to do the impossible. We do not request that you deny your grief, ignore your sorrow, suppress your tears, or pretend that death is not real. Death is awesome. We will miss the touch of his vanished hand and the sound of his mellifluous voice. We dare not say to you, don't cry, for even Jesus, in the power of perfect being, wept bitterly at the tomb of his brother Lazarus. There is a quality and cleansing and clarity and release that comes by way of honest tears. Tears, says the immortal Fred Sampson, tears are the relief valves that keep our hearts from breaking. Why? should we tease you by saying, don't cry? I rather like the way Paul put it when he said, you may have to cry, but do not cry like others who have no hope. That's right. That's right. We do have hope, That's right. yeah. and yet we cry. Because with hope comes security. We have hope. The Westminster Confession of Faith puts the question this way, what is the chief end of humankind? The chief end of humankind is to glorify God and enjoy God forever. We dare to defy death by praising God. We are deliberately confusing the enemy by thanking God on this day for what we have received from this immortal ministry. We are not here to worship at the shrine of sorrow in the cult of desperation, but we are here clothed in our right minds to celebrate and demonstrate life's victory over death. We are here to think positively as we are told to do in Philippians, the fourth chapter, the eighth verse, and verses following. Finally, my beloved, whatever is true, whatever is 
honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any virtue and if there is any praise, think on these things and the God of peace will be with you. Think about the many wonderful things that you have seen in Joel, his integrity as a person, his liveliness and significance, his sanctity as a husband and a father and a grandfather, his humor as a friend and a brother, his vision as a pastor, his courage as a leader, his mind as a master teacher, his love as a good neighbor, his power as a preacher, his commitment as a pastor, and his sterling example of excellence. Life did not defeat him, therefore death cannot destroy him. So do not think down in defeat. Do not think out in a cloud of perplexity. Do not think in a circle of confusion. Do not think back with regret. Do not think forward with fear, but think up and God will give you peace. Do you remember Job? Job was a servant of God who was perfect because God called him perfect. He loved God, avoided evil, helped everybody. He was the Justice Department, Social Security, ADC, AFDC, Medicare, Medicaid, and Obamacare, all wrapped up in one bundle of a sanctified life. And yet this great man, this good man, lost everything he had in one awful swoop of dreadful calamity. He lost it all. Ten children gone, seven tall sons, three beautiful daughters gone, all of his property and livestock and retinue and revenue gone. And on the day that it first happened, Job was quite able to handle it. He said, I can take it. I'm a man. I can face it. I can make it. I'm strong. My head is bloody, but unbowed. I'm the master of my fate. I'm the captain of my soul. Naked I came from my mother's womb. Naked shall I return to Mother Earth. The Lord gave. The Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. But that was on the first day of his tribulation. As time went on, his tune changed from the major key of praise to the minor key of despair. And he began, this perfect man began to question the existence of God. Yet this great man lost it all. This great man. And yet, he said to God, quite frankly, why is this happening to me? Have you read my giving record? Why do bad things happen to perfect people? Why have you targeted me and afflicted and stripped me naked and ripped my heart out, crushed my joy, wrecked my security, ruined my health? Why did you do it, God? It's not fair. I honor you, I serve you, I tithe to you, I worship you. Why have you done this to me? Speak to me, answer me, tell me something. I got a problem with you up there. You're too distant, too absent, too silent. Where, where are you? I look behind me, I can't see you. I look to my right, I cannot perceive you. I look to my left, I cannot behold you. I look straight, straight up and I can't find you. Oh, that I knew where I might find you, I would come into your presence and give you a piece of my mind. And for a long time, nothing happened. Just the emptiness, just the silence. Do you remember Isaiah, the greatest of the Hebrew prophets? Perhaps two Isaiahs, perhaps three, perhaps more. First Isaiah of the 8th century BC is the first to speak, and then of course there's Deutero Isaiah for the middle of the 6th century BC, then there's Trito Isaiah of the late 6th century BC. Do you remember that it was Isaiah who prophesied the birth of Christ 700 years before it happened? It was Isaiah who said, 
in Isaiah 9, 6, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, the government shall be upon his shoulders and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Well now, Isaiah was not always so certain about the future in a wicked world of tragedy and treachery. And Isaiah was made to cry out, Oh Lord, how long? Not just why, but how long? It was Samuel Woodrow Williams of Morehouse who said that the question how long is much more profound than the question why. The reason being you can put up with anything if it doesn't last too long, even this sermon. Do you remember Habakkuk, the dancing jubilee prophet of Holy Ghost joy? He said, nothing can steal my joy. Though the fig tree do not blossom, nor fruit beyond the vine, the labor of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no cattle in the stall. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. Well now, that sounds good, but Habakkuk could not maintain that attitude. There was a day when Habakkuk was suffering and his people were hurting and Habakkuk didn't know why. So he went up into the high watchtower and he waited to hear from God. He said, come here, my savior, talk to me. Don't send an angel, don't send a book, don't send Charles Adams, don't send for the doctor, just come yourself and tell me what's going on. But Habakkuk received no immediate answer or visitation from God. He just had to wait until God was ready to talk. Do you remember Paul? the great apostle of the early church who wrote more of the New Testament than any single author. Thirteen letters were inspired by him or were written directly by him or his secretary or somebody. But it's there. Paul was in no shape to do any writing when he had a thorn sticking him in his flesh, hindering his work and troubling his mind. He prayed three times to have the thorn removed, but the thorn remained, and there was no immediate answer to Paul's painful predicament, and he just continued to wonder why this throbbing thorn had been given to him. Pious people say, don't question God, but God does not say, don't question God. You will never read in the Bible that God doesn't want to be questioned. God is good enough, strong enough, and intelligent enough to answer the questions of hurting people. Everybody that ever had a deep relationship with God felt close enough to God to ask God why, how long, whence, whither. Even Jesus, who was God in human flesh, was honest enough to question God. Even Jesus, Son of God, substance of God, essence of God, presence of God, even Jesus, when he was dying on Calvary, said, my God, my God, why? The most perfect people in the world were moved to question God. And the good news today is that when you question God, when you agonize over the problem of life and the mystery of suffering, the good news is God will question you. He will, God will answer you. God will answer you sometimes in the form of a question. You will he answer not just the question. God will answer you because you are bigger than your mind, deeper than your pain, and greater than your question. 
God will answer you because you are more important than the question that you raised. If God answered just the question, you would still not be satisfied because you would not be able to understand the language that God would use. It wouldn't be the answer you're looking for. The wisdom of God is too vast to squeeze into the tiny space of human understanding. You cannot contain the Atlantic Ocean in a teacup, and you cannot contain the mind of God in a tiny thimble of human intelligence. So God will do more than answer your question. God will answer you. He will answer your pain. He will answer your perplexity. He will answer your grief. He will answer more than your question. And he may not tell you everything you want to know, but he will give you everything you need to know to make it through this day. Jesus does not want to settle for mere words. Jesus does not want you to be left groping for truth with nothing but words in a book. Jesus said, I will be your answer. I will answer you. In the world, you will have tribulation. In this world, you will have mountains you can't move and sicknesses you can't heal, wrongs you can't correct, injustices you can't prevent, doors you can't open, addictions you can't break, sorrows you can't comfort, dangers you can't dodge, wars you can't stop, deaths you can't prevent, questions you can't answer, and answers that you cannot understand. And the answer is, be of good cheer, I have overcome the world and through me you will overcome. So wake up, think up, look up, reach up, pray up, stand up, rise up, get up, go up, keep up, stay up, speak up, but do not give up. And God will give you the faith to journey on. So the Lord answered Paul. He said, so you want the thorn out, do you? I, I, I'm not taking it out. I'm leaving it in. I'm going to leave it where it is because I'm still God and I still have all power in my hand. I'm going to leave it there so I can bless you by it, strengthen you in it, and bring you through it. I'm going to leave it there as long as you understand that my grace is sufficient for you. Their strength, they shall mount up with wings like an eagle, they will run and not be weary. They will walk and not faint. Notice God will answer in the middle of the storm. He didn't answer in the prosaic prologue of the book. He did not answer at the epilogue, epilogue at the end of the book when all Job's problems were solved. Oh no, God answers right in the middle of the trouble and the storm is raging and the center is shaking and it is then that God will show up present in the problem, seated in the storm, and active in adversity. Lift up your head, lift up your heart, and God will bring you through. Get up, look up, thank God, praise God, and your problems will turn out to be nothing in comparison to God's presence. Notice that when we, cry, when we fly out, leaving today, uh, there may come a storm and we don't want to get on the plane when it's storming and when it's cloudy and dull and sometimes we want to take over Delta Airline and tell them when we think it's safe to fly but there's a certain logic in getting off the ground and that is that the higher you get the smaller the world becomes and the trees are still there but they look like little plants. The oceans are still there, but they look like puddles. The mountains are still there, but they look like mole hills. The burdens are still there, but they look like blessings. The problems are still there, but they look like new possibilities. The grief is still there, but it looks like grace. Death is still there, but it looks like a doorway leading to everlasting life. Notice, Brother Joseph Roberts was unique. All preachers are unique. God doesn't make anybody exactly like you. And I want you to know that when you think about 
Dr. Roberts, you're going to think about how unique he was as a person. He walked with integrity. He served with humility. He dressed with propriety. He preached with authority. He taught with proficiency. He loved with intensity. He worshiped with ecstasy. He suffered with serenity. He died in dignity. He woke up in eternity and he's living in victory. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Your pastor, your great pastor, would, would, would call, he'd call, I said, this man mighty busy to call me so often, and I'd pick it up every time because I knew when he was calling, he wasn't about foolishness. And he'd call, and I'd say, he's, he keeps calling, he keeps calling, he keeps calling, and we planned this party for Joe. It was going to take place early in March, not too far, from his birthday, but we knew that God was going to give us this one final event of celebration. We were going to party, 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 and we wouldn't drink anything stronger than ginger ale. But we were going to have a time. We were going to have a time. And then God took him on the 16th of February rather than the first or second week in March. God said, let me be in charge of the party. You can keep your celebration to yourself, but I'm going to give him a celebration that is far greater than any party you can plan. And that's why God answers in the middle of the question. And he's in a better land than any kind of land we know about. He's in a land where there are no lights because there is no darkness and there are no armies because there is no war and there are no cops for there is no crime and there are no ambulance because there are no more accidents and there are no more laws because there are no more violations and there are no more schools because there's no more ignorance and there are no banks because there's no more buying and there are no walls because there are no exclusions and there are no deceptions because there is no shame and there are no umbrellas because there is no rain and there are no guards because there's no more fear and there's no more crying because there's no more sorrow and there are no more doctors because there's no more sickness and there are no more nurses because there's no more pain and there are no hearses because there are no more funerals and there are no undertakers because there's no more death death and there are no handkerchiefs because there are no more tears and there's no more preaching because there's no more sin and when we've been there 10,000 years bright shining as the sun with no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun amazing grace how sweet the sound I wish I had 10,000 tongues just to say thank you if I were Chinese I'd say oh dear if I were Danish I'd say manga top if I were Italian I'd say grazia if I were Hebrew I would say toda raba if I were Japanese I'd say domo arigato if I were Portuguese I'd say obligado if I were French I'd say merci beaucoup if I were Spanish I'd say muchas gracias if I were Russian I'd say spasiba if I were Kenyan I'd say ashanta if I were Nigerian I'd say eche pupo mo du pe if I was Zulu, I'd say Ingia Bonga. If I was Sutu, I'd say Kayali Boka. If I were young, I'd say good looking out. If I were deaf, I'd say. But since I am what I am and I know what I know, I just say thank you, thank you, thank you, Joe, and thank you, Jesus. You're all right with me.